the ability to provide for technologies for integrity and confidentiality, anti-replay, etc. All right. Most people, when they think of IPsec, they think of VPNs. All right. But IPsec by itself is not a VPN. You have to look at all the technologies that go into creating these IPsec connections, like IKE and bulk encryption and key exchange, and key management, etc., cetera, etc. Cetera. That's kind of what we talk about in this this chapter here. IP security services provide confidentiality. You know what that is? Making things private. Data integrity, you know what that is, making sure things aren't changed. Origin authentication, making sure that whoever generated the message is who I expect to generate the message. IKE is the part that does that. IKE provides authentication for users. Anti-replay, making sure that the packets are not duplicated somewhere along the stream. And then, of course, our key management process. Because the keys are used for our cryptographic functions, those keys have to be secure. All right? So we have to have a way of generating <coughs> the initial key. And that's how we kind of got off on this uh, physics girl video, because generating the initial key is that process of multiplying prime numbers and factoring prime numbers. And then Rekeying, so having a, a, a way of identifying when keys should be recreated, and so on. All right? There are three bulk encryption algorithms that you need to be familiar with. DES, triple DES, and AES. SEAL. The guy that sings that song, Kiss from a Rose, right? Um, that's also another bulk encryption algorithm. Most common, of course, is AES. How did AES come about, by the way? Anybody know how AES actually came about? You know, we saw the Rindel, Rindel algorithm. That's the algorithm used in AES. Um, that's a gentleman that actually responded to a contest. The US government had a contest to develop a new algorithm. And uh, Ryan Jell is the guy that won the contest. So that is the algorithm that's used in AES. AES is what we call the encryption standard, right? Um, let's talk about key exchange, OK? Diffie-Hellman is the most popular key exchange method. It is a process that allows us to generate a key and then send that key across an open channel to a destination without exposing that key to anybody that might be sniffing that traffic. See, the thing is, most people don't realize, well, a lot of people don't realize that with bulk encryption, the keys are not pre-configured. The key has to be generated, transmitted, and learned. And then over time, that key has to be regenerated. A new key has to be regenerated, transmitted, and learned. But the key is used for encryption and decryption. So what comes first, the chicken or the egg? Well, in this case, the chicken does if it's the key. The key has to be generated before the encryption can take place. All right? Diffie-Hellman is the way we do that. EC, Diffie-Hellman is kind of the modern version of this Diffie-Hellman key exchange process. All right? So the very first part of any IPsec VPN is to do key exchange. And that is done with the IKE process, Internet Key Exchange process. We'll see that a little bit later on. So I thank you for I leave. Is there another book for CCMP? Oh, for CCPA, you mean? No, there's no book for CCPA. There's a study guide, yes. And I'll make sure I get that to you guys. I need to update that one because they just changed that test. So I would focus on getting your CCNA out of the way first. 
Then the security, you got the security study guide, right? Yep. The voucher for the DA is still valid for a year, so there's no rush on that. All right. Can we get a voucher or just contact you already? You just contact me when you're ready. We don't actually issue vouchers, um, but we have it documented. Okay? All right. I don't to take care of it. You know what, though? Your, CC, your, your ICD 1 and 2 is going to change soon. So, yeah. And when does that change? August 22nd. And then September 22nd. Yeah. The first one's 20, well, August 22nd 20. for the first one. But you're going to probably take that next week or something? And then September 22nd for the second test. Now, it won't change when you take the test, if you take it before those dates. August 22nd and September. Mm -hmm. that too. Like on the chat. It will change. Is it the second one? Second one. Yeah. Okay. Yep. All right. Thanks. Take care. Be good. Mm -hmm. I'll send you the certificate yeah. to your private email. Okay. Of course, we know what data integrity is. We know what HMAC is, right? A MAC is a way for us to um, generate a hash. HMAC has a hash that also includes um, uh, HMAC has a hash that also includes a key. All right. So you have your arbitrary length of data that goes through the hash process with the secret key. What comes out is this MAC message authentication code, and then we send the hash along with the data. All right. Now, as far as authentication goes for IPsec, there are many, many different ways of performing authentication um, for the peers. Remember, because we're talking about IPsec, we're talking about establishing a tunnel between two endpoints, okay? For IPsec VPNs, the most common form of uh, mutual peer authentication is PSK, stands for pre-shared keys. That's the most common form where you actually statically configure the pre-shared key between each endpoints. You can also use RSA signatures where you have a private and public key signed signatures or you can use DSA. DSA is uh, the newer version of RSA, digital signatures. Okay? So this is the IPsec framework. You've got processes for key management, Ike version 1 and Ike version 2. This is what I was talking about, uh, Bernard, that Ike is not an encryption standard. It's a key exchange standard. And there are two different kinds of key exchange standards, Ike 1 and Ike 2. But the only thing that Ike is used for is key management, which kind of makes sense because it's called Internet Key Exchange. All right? Authentication, either a pre-shared key or RSA, using digital certificates, integrity using MD5 or SHA, confidentiality using DES, triple DES, or AES, and then, of course, IPsec protocol. Now, these are actually not, these top three boxes here are not really technically protocols. ESP stands for encapsulated security payload. That means VPN with encryption only, but without authentication. AH stands for authentication header. That means VPN with authentication only, but without encryption. It is possible to run a VPN technology that includes authentication, but doesn't include encryption. ESP plus AH, that's the most common form, includes encryption plus authentication. Make sense? It is a good slide because it gives you that visual representation of all the moving pieces. A lot of people don't realize that there are these multiple layers to cryptography. All right? And, of course, in the chapter, we break down all of these different components. We've already seen a few of them. So let's talk about Internet Key Exchange.
And by the way, we'll see this applied then. Uh, and this is where it's going to become more interesting for you guys. And you can do this in Packet Tracer or GNS3, where you can set up a VPN tunnel between two routers. Okay? So we'll kind of finish up this chapter by looking at setting up a VPN uh, configuration. All right? So what is the Ike protocol used for? It's used for SA parameter negotiation. What does SA stand for? Besides the uh, Mexican gangster on the side of the street. SA. 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 <laughs> what does SA stand for? Security Association. You'll see that term used quite a bit uh, in cryptography. Security Association. Ike is responsible for establishing the parameters of the IPsec tunnel. It's also used for key generation, authentication, and key regeneration. Because we don't use just one key for an encrypted tunnel, we use multiple keys. Over time, we change the keys. Keys have a lifetime. That lifetime is either defined by an amount of data that's being encrypted with that key or a timestamp. Because it's been determined that modern technologies can derive keys much faster than these old legacy technologies that we used to have back in the day. So the idea is to change the key so that if somebody is trying to perform cryptanalysis on our cryptographic system, the key changes before they make any decent progress and now they have to start all over again. Now Ike 2 does all the same things that Ike 1 did, but it's faster. It has dead peer detection, so we can identify when a, when a, a VPN peer is no longer uh, accessible. Um, it's got stronger security through denial of service protection mechanisms. We'll see that maybe a little bit later on. And it does a, a mobile key exchange as well, layer 3 roaming, moving from one subnet to another, by main, but still allowing you to maintain the uh, VPN integrity. Okay? All right. So, phase one, and we're going to see the configuration of this a little bit later. In fact, the next section, we're going to break down the actual syntax that's used to establish this VPN. Phase one is the key exchange process. So, the first thing is we negotiate our policy. This policy is, okay, what type of encryption are we going to use? How long are the keys going to be valid for? What is our what is our pre-shared, what is our authentication mechanism? Are we using RSA? Are we using a pre-shared key? So all of the parameters of the security association are being negotiated here. Then we do our Diffie-Hellman key exchange. What is the purpose of this step right here? What is the purpose of that step? Anybody? We're exchanging public keys, like you've been done before. No? We're using an asymmetric process to, so I'm using a, a certificates to exchange our bulk encryption key. Okay? But this key exchange means that that bulk encryption key is encrypted using another process with, that we talked about with the asymmetric process that we talked about earlier. So the bulk encryption key is exchanged and then we move to authenticate the peers. This is all part of phase one. At this point, we have not established a VPN tunnel. We've only negotiated the properties that are going to be used for the VPN tunnel. And that's what Internet Key Exchange is used for. Now there's two modes of Ike. There's aggressive mode and there's main mode. Main mode uses this three-step process. Aggressive mode combines a couple of those steps to make it a little bit faster. But ultimately it's kind of the same thing. So here's the negotiation of the Ike proposals. 
These are pre-configured proposals on the router or the firewall. And essentially what has to happen is both devices have to agree on a policy. The policy numbers don't have to match, but the properties of the policy have to match. So clearly these two policies match, right? We're going to use AES-128 for encryption. We're going to use SHA-256 for message integrity. We're going to use pre-shared keys for authentication instead of RSA. The lifetime of our keys are going to be 43,200 seconds, and we're going to use Diffie-Hellman Group 5 for the key exchange process. The larger, the, or the, the higher the Diffie-Hellman Group number, the larger the key space. So you'll typically see higher Diffie-Hellman group numbers for the more uh, robust encryption protocols. Like DAS would use Diffie-Hellman group 1. Triple DAS would use Diffie-Hellman group 2. And so on. Okay? By the way, here's what happens. Router A sends all of its policies to Router B in the initial establishment of the VPN. Router B chooses the policy it wants to use and then notifies Router A that's the policy we're going to use. So whoever initiates the tunnel doesn't actually negotiate the policy. The recipient of the policies is the one that negotiates which policy to use. And the idea is that they're going to find one that they have both in common. These are called the security association parameters. Giovanni, Bernard, are you guys still there? They were telling me. We were saying goodbye. So. Hmm? We were yelling goodbye, and that's when oh. Giovanni said to you. Oh. Okay. Giovanni's there. Bernard must be recording it. He's going to get the recording of Louis C.K. Right. Now, as far as the Diffie Hellman key exchange process goes, it's a mathematical principle, right? Y sub A, Y sub B. These are the keys. Well, this is the authentication process that's being generated. You've got a private value and a public value. You've got a private value here and a public value here. The public values are what get shared. The simplest way to understand this concept is paint buckets. Right? We talked. Did we do the paint bucket thing? We never did the paint bucket thing. The paint bucket is the easiest way to understand this process. So let me show you the paint bucket. Oh yes, you did. The colors mix. Yeah, you did do that. Yeah. I thought I did. Yeah, you did. I'll Sorry. show it to you again. Huh? Well, I corrected myself. Jeez. Well, why did I go to YouTube? I didn't want to go there. I don't know. You want to go to paint, do you? No, I'm not going to re recreate it this okay. time. You did do it. So you had some funky colors. Well, there's a lot of people that have this already documented online, mm -hmm. so I'm just going to show you a picture. Okay. Hold on, picture there, dude. Yeah. Oh, there they come. The internet is so slow today, man. I'm surprised the WebEx is even working. Okay? So, here's the paint bucket scenario. All right? The red color in, is equivalent to saying the X sub A and X sub B. These other colors here, well, the common color is equivalent to saying, well, almost, Y sub A, Y sub B. 
So if I go through and I, I create this common color by doing modulo math against X sub B, I send that to Alice. Alice sends her paint to Bob. And then Alice combines her, public, her private paint with Bob's public paint. And Bob combines his private paint with Alice's public paint. They both end up with a common paint color. And that is what the bulk encryption key ends up being. So we're sharing information but we're not sharing any information that can be used by somebody in the middle to derive the common paint color. Because the only way that you can get this common secret paint color is if you know the secret colors, and the secret colors are never shared. Alice has a can of yellow paint. Bob has a can of yellow paint. That's publicly known paint color. Alice has her private paint, which is orange. Bob has his private paint, which is teal. Bob combines his private paint with his public paint. I didn't know what I would turn blue. But it is. Might turn blue. But is, if somebody intercepts this blue paint, are they going to be able to derive what those common paints are? No. Or what the secret paint is, because there are multiple colors that can be combined to create this blue paint. You can't unmix paint after it's been mixed. All right? Anyway, you guys get the idea. They can take a, a, a sample of it, the Home Depot, they can match it for you. Yes. They can match it based on the paint colors that they have. Yes. All right? That, that goes to this whole concept of it's easy to create, but it's difficult to uncreate, right? The third exchange is to authenticate the peer. Typically, this is done with a pre-shared key. Like I said, we can use RSA signatures to do this as well, okay? If I can't authenticate the peer, the tunnel is not negotiated. If I can authenticate the peer, that's when we start to move into phase two of the encryption process, which is the bulk encryption process. Okay? The NICE account stands for? Key Management Protocol. ISA. Now, what is ISA? Security Association Key Management Protocol. Um, I'm trying to think what the I stands for. Internet Security Association. Internet Security, Security Association and Key Management Protocol. Again, a very simple acronym. I can't remember it. I get tired too sometimes. Okay. We're winding down. Huh? We're winding down. Get out of the boat. Yeah. All right, you're going to need to know this for the test. Authentication header runs on protocol 51. ESP runs on protocol 50. AH provides for authentication without encryption. ESP provides for encryption. Okay. ESP provides for encryption. 